Okay, now is the time to get started. Um, good morning and welcome to you all. My name is Jiyoung Park. I'm from Asan Institute for Policy Studies. And today, in this morning, we will have the first session on the future of ROK-US nuclear cooperation agreement. The ROK-US nuclear cooperation agreement, or one to three agreement, has been signed and revised in 1972 and 1974, and it will expire on March 2014. Since the agreement, the Republic of Korea's nuclear capability or the nuclear status has been elevated to that of an international nuclear exporter or supplier of nuclear power plants. However, however, in Korea, we just have the middle part of the nuclear fuel cycle. The current ROK-US nuclear cooperation agreement only allows nuclear material supplied to the ROK to be altered into a form acceptable to both parties. Now the ROK is considering closing its nuclear fuel cycle because it believes that the potential buyers are hesitant in purchasing Korean nuclear power technology because the the, the, the limitations that are imposed by the agreement. And regarding the back-end fuel cycle, the pool storage in South Korea for the spent fuel is about to be full in the near future. So Korea wants to minimize the growing inventory of spent fuel through pyroprocessing, which is under development currently. But we need to have broader consent on its R&D because the case-by-case -case review will take much time to perform the research and development. The negotiations between the, country, between the two countries for a new bilateral agreement will continue through this year, and we'll have a, the, the, the result of this negotiation will have broad bilateral, regional, and global implications. So this, pan, this panel will explore the legal, technical, economical, environmental, and political issues related to the ROK-US nuclear cooperation agreement. As you can see here, I have quite a lot of uh, panelists today. And um, on my left, we have Mark Hibbs, who is a senior associate of nuclear policy program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He is an editor and correspondent for nuclear energy publications, including Nucleonics Week and Nuclear Fuel for over 20 years. His research work covered nuclear developments in the Soviet bloc as well as emerging nuclear programs in East Asia. And he will cover political and economic aspects of the 1-3 agreement and his perspectives on the next step of the negotiations. Next to Mark, we have Professor Shin Sung Ho. He is a professor, associate professor at the Graduate School of International Studies of Seoul National University. He was a visiting professor at the East West Center, which is residing in this Washington, D.C., and he was a CNEPS fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he will discuss about the strategic approach to the negotiation for the both countries. And in the middle, we have uh, Mr. Scott Snyder. He is a senior fellow for Korea Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is an editor of Global Korea, South Korea's contributions to international security and the U.S.-South Korea alliance. And he worked at the Asia Foundation between 2000 and 2011 and a representative in Seoul. And I, I expect his presentation will be in the aspect of ROK-US alliance. Okay. And next to him, we have Sharon Skasuni. She is a senior fellow and director of proliferation prevention program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She is a member of the Fissile Materials Working Group and serves on the board of the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation. 
She's been working for non-proliferation for quite a long time, and I think she will have the comprehensive presentation on the 1-2-3 agreement. And my far left, Professor Im Man Sung, he is a professor at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and he is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Progress in Nuclear Energy. He, and he was a senior researcher at Korea Atomic Research Institute. He is now deeply involved in the study of nuclear fuel cycle, and he will talk about Korean perspectives on the 1-3 agreement. Okay, now, without further introduction, I would like to uh, turn, over, turn the podium over to Mr. Hibbs, and he will begin the discussion. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm unfortunately going to have to tell you that I had a cyber meltdown on my computer about a week ago, so I don't have any, any deeply organized presentation here, and what I'm going to do, because the time is limited, I will go through a number of points that I think are salient that we can pick up during the discussion. Uh, and when I get to my allotted time, then I'll just cut it off, and we can revisit these, these points later and bring any other further issues up. Um, as we just heard, this negotiation um, is happening because the, the existing agreement will expire after 40 years in March of 2014. Um, the most difficult part of the negotiation has to do, as you, many of you know, with the issue of enrichment and reprocessing, so-called ENR, um, where during the period of time during which the, previous, the existing agreement has been in, up, in force, uh, the nuclear program uh, in Korea has been making steady advances. And the ROK now wants to get involved in commercial uranium enrichment, as well as uh, we just heard uh, introduce pyroprocessing into their mix of, of activities. Um, I'm going to present you just some brief notes about the context of this in the United States because, as you're probably also aware, after 9-11 and the revelation of the HQ Khan uh, network's activities in, in several countries at the end, beginning at the end of the 1990s, since about 2000, the U.S. government has been dedicated to limiting the spread of ENR worldwide. And that's happening at a time, as you say, when Korea now is advancing a case uh, for doing enrichment and reprocessing in Korea. Um, in the United States, there's been a discussion of how the U.S. will go forward with future negotiations of 123 agreements. Um, there's a number of them on the horizon. After the agreement with the UAE was renegotiated in 2008, um, momentum was generated in the political... <coughs> process in Washington toward uh, the advocacy by some individuals for the blanket uh, application of a mandate for negotiation or a rule, if you will, to have all future agreements with the United States based on a foregoing of enrichment reprocessing by U.S. Uh, partner countries. Um, this has come under some scrutiny during the course of the last year and a half. The U.S. executive branch has walked this back toward a policy of so-called case-by-case negotiations. This is still very much in flux as, as we uh, speak right now, having to do with the, the way the U.S. administration will be uh, rebooting itself under the second term of the President Obama. Um, that's happening in parallel with this negotiation with the ROK. It should be pointed out that, if, that the ROK negotiation is not based on this assumption of no ENR policy for the new agreements, but it is clearly the, setting the political context for the negotiation. Um, it also should be pointed out that, that the, the, the desire of the ROK 
to obtain what is called programmatic approval for pyroprocessing or, or reprocessing um, is happening uh, after a long period where the United States had a policy of not providing that programmatic approval without uh, the country in question having an experience of using these technologies uh, for a certain period of time. Um, a number of people in the last couple of days have asked me what I think is going to happen at the end of the day. And I think because we're running short on time in the negotiation, um, I think what's going to happen is this. Um, the United States is not prepared right now to accept the demands, proposals for the agreement that were put forth by the ROK and vice versa. Um, because there's little time, I think probably the most likely outcome and the best case outcome for both the ROK and the United States would be for the existing agreement that we have to be extended or rolled over for a period of number of years, perhaps two years, perhaps three, perhaps as many as 10 years until about 2021 when a joint study on pyroprocessing is completed and a verdict will be made by both parties on how to move forward on this. Uh, the short term, if this is the outcome, the short term would be beneficial for, I would argue, even for North Korea, South Korea's case because, as we've seen in the, advent, or the aftermath of the North Korean third test and the anticipation that North Korea will continue testing, the outcome of this will be to, in a sense, in the short term, to enhance the value and the importance of the ROK-US security relationship. And that will not play into the hand of the ROK's negotiating position in, with the United States on this agreement. Um, in the long term, however, even if the present, agree present agreement we have is, is extended for a period of time until you know, uh, uh, decisions are, are made down the road on, on these substantial issues, um, there's going to be problems because, in my view, if pressure from the North continues, and the, North, and the South Korean program continues on course, there will be some pressure from conservative politicians in the ROK to move Korea and position Korea toward having a certain capability, uh, a threshold capability, if you will, perhaps on the model of Japan. Um, I don't say it's going to happen. It won't be overnight. We're, I'm talking about something that could happen in 10 years. It could happen in 15 years, depending on how things evolve. Um, I also want to point out that one of the reasons it's going to be difficult is because as time goes on, it will become more and more difficult for the United States to deny consent to the ROK to get involved in these activities because of a number of factors. One of them being the uh, justification for the activities in the nuclear program, the, the nuclear power program in Korea is, as we can see today, is, is safe. It has a firm commercial basis. Um, there may be a demonstrated need for Korea to get involved in fuel cycle activities. The scale of the ROK nuclear program is increasing, but fundamentally the, the, the real nut to crack for the United States is the fact that Korea has an additional protocol in the NPT. And every year since the protocol went into force, it has benefited from a broader conclusion from the IAEA that the agency is satisfied that all of South Korea's nuclear activities are dedicated to peaceful use. That's a key condition that the United States has seen for moving forward in bilateral cooperation. And when we move out of the arena of Washington politics where these issues are debated, including in civil society, we move toward... Uh, other places where the U.S. is involved in multilateral negotiations and nuclear diplomacy. We see the United States exposed to criticism, particularly in the aftermath of the U.S.-India deal, where the U.S. awarded India programmatic approval for reprocessing, regardless of the fact that India was not a member of the treaty. So there are going to be these equity issues that the United States 
diplomacy is going to have to deal with in the future, and it's going to make it more difficult for the United States to, to move forward in this direction. Now, I realize that our time is limited. I've taken up seven minutes of the time already. I have other points to make, but perhaps to be fair to our other panelists, I'd like to stop now and, and allow the others to move forward. Okay, thank you. Professor Shin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think uh, Mr. Hibbs uh, laid out a very good groundwork for this uh, panel at the moment. And I'm not going to talk about all this technical issue because I'm not an you know, expert on the nuclear science. I will also talk about uh, from the broad uh, perspective of US ROK or ROK US, uh, the relationship or the alliance. And uh, in my uh, opinion, uh, and, and I quite uh, agree with uh, many of the points that made by uh, Mr. Hibbs uh, here. And some of them, uh, my point is to, you know, in a way, uh, reinforce that uh, point. One is that uh, this uh, should not be a test case uh, for the bilateral relationship or the alliance uh, between the ROK and the United States. But there is a danger at the moment. I mean, uh, yes, in a way, this is uh, about the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy. And this is very much about the strict technical issue. But at the same time, it could become a very much a political issue. And it has been already uh, politicized in a way. But I think the two governments need to really make sure this should not become a domestic political issue from the both sides. And I'm, I'm quite sure that the both uh, understand uh, that point. But at the same time, then, uh, the time at the, at the moment, as Mr. Ip said, uh, the time is, 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 is running out. And, uh, for the two governments to, they're supposed to come to a certain kind of basic agreement, if not this much at least uh, uh, for the first half of this year, so that they can go to the each uh, uh, Congress and to get through uh, the ratified. In that sense, I don't think we have enough time at the moment. And I'm, first of all, I don't know much about the details of negotiation that's going on, uh, but. I, I suppose, uh, especially with this new government in South Korea, uh, it's going to be quite uh, difficult for the two to come to a very concrete agreement. So in the meantime, so in that sense, uh, they, again, they need to uh, make sure this uh, is not about the testing the alliance. This is not about uh, United States. It's, it's, you know, uh, it's not trusting South Korea. Uh, it's quite interesting that uh, the the president-elect, uh, uh, Madame Balconet, talks much about the trust-based diplomacy. And I think that's one of the key issues here, uh, how much of trust these two governments have uh, about each other. But I think uh, so far uh, in the, uh, the record, uh, in general, the alliance has been very good uh, in the previous, uh, not previous, still the current uh, Imyang Park administration. And I, I think uh, that uh, relationship will continue under the new leadership in South Korea because the basic setting in overall uh, the foreign policy and, and I think in particular towards North Korea is in the, quite in the same pace. And I think that's very important and that's uh, quite a positive uh, aspect of this uh, to government uh, in the uh, five years ahead under the, this new uh, <coughs> South Korean leadership. So first, uh, this should not become a test case for the alliance. But to do so, the second is uh, that I just uh, mentioned, the one thing, the good is that the, these two governments have a very same approach to this North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, program. At the same time, on the other side of the coin is because of this North Korea's nuclear program, from both ends, from the U.S., they have a very deep concern about this, uh, this new, uh, the implication of this uh, new agreement. At the same time, <clears throat> in the South Korea right now, uh, there is some kind of, uh, you know, a uh, uh, some ripple effect of, I think, the, uh, the so-called third nuclear, after the uh, uh, third nuclear test. The bottom line is the two governments also have to make sure this has nothing to do with North Korea's nuclear program. And so in particular from the Korean side, 
they have to make sure this is only for, and um, this is one, two, three, uh, revision of our agreement is about the peaceful use of nuclear energy. But uh, I'm aware in these days, uh, the, the, some media report and even some um, uh, public sentiment is that, oh, if North Korea goes for such a kind of nuclear program and weapon, and it's almost uh, quite sure that they are becoming an uh, actual nuclear power, uh, I mean, nuclear weapon state, in that case, maybe we should do something. And I think there is a danger of uh, connecting this issue to the North Korea's nuclear program, which will make much more difficult for the negotiation uh, to, to come through. So, again, this, both, uh, uh, is in particular, the South Korean side need to make sure that this has nothing to do with uh, North Korea or this has nothing to do with any kind of uh, nuclear weapon program. This is uh, specifically only for the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy in South Korea. The third point is that uh, eventually it should come down to, a, to the, the, the issue of, uh, from the U.S. Uh, side, they need to uh, acknowledge or, or the, the growing need and capacity of uh, South Korea's uh, nuclear program that is only for the peaceful use. And in that sense, the uh, U.S. need to show more respect for South Korea's need and demand on that issue. At the same time, South Korea also need to show more responsibility on this issue. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Hip said, uh, in a sense, the South Korea is becoming a very important partner uh, for the United States uh, in this uh, new century. Overall, uh, yes, uh, we are quite powerful economy at the same time. Uh, militarily, we are very important uh, you know, ally for the uh, United States. But in, even in nuclear energy sector in particular, especially after the Fukushima incident, the Japan and uh, Germany uh, was quite a uh, uh, big, important player in the nuclear energy. But these two countries are reconsidering uh, in this field, and if they really indeed go into the other direction, that uh, shutting down all their nuclear power plant, then there are not many countries uh, in the world that uh, you know, nuclear energy is uh, so important and uh, their capacity is so important. And obviously at the moment, the United States still is the number one nuclear power generating country in the world. They need to operate on this issue, they need to continue on their research on this issue. And in that, South Korea will become an ever more increasingly important uh, partner for on this uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy. So I think in that sense, United States need to um, you know, show some more respect on the South Korea's uh, status in this field. And of course, again, as I said, uh, South Korea also needs to show more responsibility. And I think South Korea has been doing it already, as uh, Mr. Hip said. We are being recognized as a very responsible um, partner for the MPT, not only for the this United States. And uh, we also hosted the Nuclear Security Summit uh, last year, the second summit after the Washington summit. And there, uh, the two countries not only just focus, maybe the two governments need to broaden its uh, uh, scope in this uh, issue, not only just focus on this bilateral you know, agreement and negotiation, at the same time, they may uh, <coughs> talk about some broad uh, the, the nuclear governance issue, which includes non-proliferation as well as you know, development of uh, next generation nuclear technology in the, in, the, in the field and how they can cooperate more constructively. So these are the uh, points that I just want to make. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Snyder? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I want to thank Asan Institute for inviting me here and uh, to be a part of this uh, uh, forum. Um, I always feel like an amateur when I'm at a nuclear uh, gathering, uh, and I always learn quite a bit from my colleagues who are really, you know, uh, deep specialists on nuclear nonproliferation issues. Uh, I'm here as a regional specialist, and... Um, uh, really, this particular issue of the U.S.-South Korea bilateral nuclear cooperation agreement is something that began to cross my radar screen about three or four years ago. 
Uh, and the reason why it crossed my radar screen is because increasingly I heard people refer to this issue as a potential train wreck in the relationship. And that was very disturbing to me, and so I tried to learn more about why that would be the case. Um, and, you know, the case that I want to lay out, uh, especially given that going third, almost all the good points have been made, is simply just how um, uh, important and valuable nuclear cooperation has been in the context of this relationship. Uh, it's really incredible if you stop and think about the benefits that have come from U.S.-Korea nuclear cooperation. Um, obviously, South Korea's nuclear industry has been developed on the basis of that cooperation. South Korea has developed deep technical experience uh, and know-how, uh, and uh, experience with design and manufacture of reactors. Um, South Korea is now an exporter uh, of nuclear plants. None of this would have happened without U.S.-Korea without a U.S.-Korea bilateral nuclear cooperation agreement. And I think that both sides are going to benefit from continuing cooperation because really this agreement underpins South Korean nuclear export aspirations. Uh, I think the U.S. ROK-123 serves as a good housekeeping seal of approval for the quality of South Korean nuclear products and design. Um, South Korea also, uh, I think South Korea wouldn't want to export to countries that didn't have one, two, three agreements with the United States. And so really the U.S. one, two, three framework internationally, you know, creates um, uh, the framework for what South Korea is trying to do uh, with its own uh, program. And if all of that were wiped, wiped away, basically, I think neither side can really afford to abandon uh, an agreement. And that means we actually have no choice, both sides have no choice but to come to an understanding on this set of issues. Um, Mark laid out a lot of the core issues that are you know, under discussion, uh, and uh, Sung Ho talked about you know, this. What I've noticed is that when the political scientists get involved, they talk about trust. The technical experts are much better at actually working out cooperation. And so I'm inclined to leave this to the technical experts to be able to really uh, address the core issues and hope that the regional specialists don't overly politicize the issue uh, in ways that actually uh, raise these issues to a level disproportionate to their overall importance uh, in the context of the relationship. Um, I think one of the major issues you know, on, on the horizon here is really related to time frame. Uh, and I think it's understandable when we look at how South Korea's nuclear industry has changed over the course of the past 40 years, why South Korea might feel uncomfortably being locked into a 30-year time frame for an agreement uh, without the opportunity to address some of the concerns that are related to enrichment and reprocessing that the South Korean government has raised. Uh, at the same time, when I listen carefully to South Korean government officials, what I hear them asking for at this stage is a right to do something that they want to do, that they, that they want to actually do in the future. And that suggests to me that actually we do have time, that it's fair to try to buy time. Uh, and I think um, you know, Mark and Sung Ho have already raised the issue of uh, the nuclear test and the debate here in South Korea that I think is important. I think another issue that actually puts this into um, uh, less relief uh, is actually the shale oil revolution in the United States uh, and the impact in terms of price points for uh, nuclear, uh, the nuclear industry. Uh, and um, in fact, I think that South Korea and the United States may need to step back and try to frame their issues uh, related to nuclear and LNG in the broader context of energy security. That might be an interesting way of trying to you know, think about uh, this relationship in more holistic terms. And I'll just add one other issue that I think is interesting as we think about kicking the can down the road a little bit. Uh, Mark mentioned equity issues related to India. Uh, I'm going to be brave and mention equity issues related to Japan because the United States and Japan also have to negotiate a nuclear cooperation agreement uh, uh, that is going to expire shortly. Um, and we all know that Japan 
has a reprocessing right, but we also know that um, the, well, basically, if we knew today what we had known then, it's unlikely that that right would necessarily have been granted, and it might not have even been asked for, I don't know. Um, probably depends on which perspective you look at it from. Uh, but, you know, maybe following the negotiation of that agreement, um, we can have a better sense of what equity would look like as it relates to South Korean desires to obtain uh, advanced consent. Uh, I do think that the equity issue is a serious one that has to be addressed in some form, but it may well be in Korea's interest to see that set of equity issues addressed eight or ten years from now rather than today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Asan, for inviting me here to talk about this um, very important issue. And, you know, it tends to become an emotional discussion, but we've all been very calm here on this panel. So <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up on um, two points, I think, that Scott made. This issue of energy security. Um, th there are two things. One is energy security and the other is Korea's competitiveness in nuclear supply, so fuel assurances to its um, competitors. Um, I'm here to tell you that there is no such thing as energy independence. It does not exist, okay? The best any country can hope for is energy interdependence. And actually, the Korean agreement with the UAE is a perfect example of cooperation of, across a broad range of nuclear industry in a lot of different countries. So even though I've heard the argument that um, you know, Korean competitiveness will suffer if it doesn't have an enrichment capability, actually the UAE chose Korean reactors, even though it didn't have domestic enrichment. And how did ENEC do this? They you know, gave the prime contractor to KEPCO, but then they sort of parceled out enrichment uh, contracts to Urenco and Rosatom and Areva. And so that enriched uranium project product then goes to Korea nuclear fuel to be fabricated into fuel. That is actually how the global nuclear industry works. And even though the U.S. looks like this monolithic, you know, 25% capacity of of reactors across the world, we get most of our uranium from overseas. And we get a lot of enrichment from overseas. And we got a, get a lot of uh, conversion. So I think that, um, I, I don't want people to sort of, I, I agree on the shale gas and nuclear. I mean, I think every country has to diversify across um, uh, a wide variety of resources. And in nuclear supply, uh, Korea and the U.S. and the Japanese all need to do that. I wanted to make um, a few points just on the, some strategic and economic and, and political points. Um, I think Mark kind of made the point that this is not about the gold standard for Korea. Nobody's thinking that we're going to ask Korea to forswear enrichment or reprocessing. That would be silly. Uh, and that's not going to happen. In Congress, there is, I think, still interest in pursuing a stronger uh, policy on enrichment and reprocessing, even though the tides have turned. You might have heard that the U.S. Congress is, doesn't cooperate well with President Obama. Uh, when you look at the House Foreign Affairs Committee under Chairman Royce, the new chairman, he has a very strong uh, non-proliferation interest. And my guess is, is that he will pursue some of these bills to amend the Atomic Energy Act, but I don't think Korea needs to be concerned about that. So this is not about the gold standard. It is about, and here's where I would kind of underscore the point that Mark made, this is about applying U.S. non-proliferation principles fairly across all states. And Mark mentioned that the U.S. has not granted programmatic consent to countries that do not have enrichment or reprocessing already. And so, <coughs> I'm going to steal Gary Seymour's points from yesterday because <laughs> I thought they were really 
Terrific, you know, keep it simple, keep it focused, keep it practical, keep it going. What is this nuclear cooperation agreement about? It's not about status. Korea already has status. It is not about equity with Japan or any other country. It's about, it's about a framework agreement that permits cooperation on nuclear projects with the US and Korea, as well as many other partners. Every agreement has um, provisions for ad hoc consent. That will continue regardless of whatever agreement we're able to, to uh, come to in the next couple months. There is, until you actually need enrichment or reprocessing, there is no point to programmatic consent. Um, when you need programmatic consent, it will become self-evident. And so, I agree with the other panelists that um, you know, time is running short. An agreement does need to get to the Congress in the next few months. Um, and it would not, um, th there are ways, you have to make some clever political moves though. <laughs> there are ways to extend the agreement. Um, I think that there is a lot at stake. Um, Scott mentioned, um, or gave a few good reasons of all the cooperation between um, Korea and the U.S. in nuclear issues. Westinghouse is part of the UAE deal. You want to keep all of those contracts moving forward quickly because Korean success in the nuclear export market is going to depend on meeting the schedule on time and on budget. And so we really should be careful not to let these political disagreements um, get in the way. I think I'm going to keep my remarks there and we'll move on to Manso. Well, thank you. Mark mentioned something about the possibility of extending this dialogue and then just maybe look at this again later. I just made a few comments on that. Probably that will help us in terms of avoiding or setting precedent to some of the other countries with upcoming one to three agreements. Taiwan, China, Saudi Arabia, and so on. So that may be a good thing, uh, or maybe it helps South Korea to develop the technology further and then we get tested at that point. But there are also some concerns. Um, you know, South Korea has been delaying their policy setting on spent fuel management, the back end fuel cycle. Everybody has been saying in the government, hey, wait until the US ROK nuclear agreement is revised then we know the boundary, then we'll come up with our policy. We've been postponing, we've been just delaying the discussion. So that has uh, some ramifications. I think also this government, the new government coming in, is somewhat sympathetic toward nuclear power development and the more continued uh, use of nuclear power. But then after five years, or maybe 10 years, we don't know what kind of administration we'll have. Uh, that administration may not be amenable to the expansion or continued use of nuclear power. So just delaying that process has potentially huge implication in terms of what will happen for the future of nuclear power in this country. But that has also a huge implication potentially, not only in Korea, but also in the United States and the globe, for the reasons I will be discussing. But some of the things that I hear from these discussions is that South Korea wants this ENR capability maybe potentially as a hedging toward the development of nuclear weapons. South Korea may be interested in developing weapons and so on. So I hear actually some of those discussions, although we don't talk about explicitly. Well, uh, there are five nuclear weapon states out there, and then there are several few uh, others outside it. But then there are, in the, he in the past, in the history, 18 states who, has, who have explored the uh, possibility of developing nuclear weapons. Most of them used civilian nuclear power program as a cover to develop their weapon capability, but mostly at the initial phase of their development. Once these countries pass certain point, meaning they have established a mature nuclear power program, they have never used that civilian power program for the diversion of for the military purposes. I believe South Korea has passed that point. Uh, 
Will South Korea be interested in nuclear power? Well, we have seen some of those, maybe public sentiment, even political voices to support the development. But according to my personal judgment, it is i m p o s s i b i l i t y for South Korea at this point. Um, nuclear weapon is no longer a symbol of national power street prestige. You know, 10 most economically competitive countries out there are non-nuclear weapon states, except the United States. Uh, although we hear a lot about North Korean nuclear weapon today or yesterday, nuclear weapon in North Korea, I believe, is not usable. They cannot use it. Uh, they know, unless they want to be on a suicidal track, they cannot use it. As soon as you use it, you're going to be annihilated. Uh, South Korea, if we do develop nuclear weapons, we're going to lose everything we have. Obviously, we're going to lose that alliance. We rely on export and import. Our economy is totally dependent on trade. The economy will be pretty much paralyzed. This country will be big, big trouble. So if you do a simple calculus on the benefits and loss, simply there is no... No, no reason to, to think about nuclear weapon in this country. Um, you know, whenever they were, in the past, Korea has made some mistakes, but whenever those happened, there were two things happening at the same time. A very serious North Korean aggression, propagation, and U.S. withdrawal of their forces from the Korean Peninsula. 1969, Nixon Doctrine. 1976, Carter planned to withdraw forces along with North Korean aggression. So if you look at the history, those two, when those two happen, then there is some discussion. But only one or the other, it doesn't make sense for Korea to think about even those nuclear weapons. Does the allowing ROK to build ENR or maybe this capability set a bad example? We hear a lot about these things. Well, if you believe that one size fits all, maybe. But we already know that one size fits all doesn't work. So the U.S. changed the position on this. Uh, you know, U.S. has provided some direct support for some of the major countries and developed a large nuclear power program, India, Japan. Eventually, the support to India led into military weapon <coughs> development. U.S. support to Japan, nuclear, support, nuclear industry support, eventually led into failure in safety and economics. So far, U.S. support to South Korea has been a success. Uh, you know, South Korea is, at this point, six, is a sixth in nuclear power generation. It has 23 nuclear power plants, has the best safety record. It is now 100% self-sufficient in terms of supply and component manufacturing everything. Uh, it is now exporting nuclear power technology. Uh, it is highly unlikely for any other countries out there in the world any newcomer countries or any aspiring countries to become a major nuclear power user or even become export, exporter. It is simply not very like, unlikely. Simply not unlikely. Simply. Unlikely. Highly unlikely. <laughs> Everybody knows that ROK is a very close ally to the United States. Rewarding ROK may be setting a good example. I want to talk about a little bit about... Uh, maybe reasons why this cooperation should evolve to both countries' interests and mutual benefits. There are several reasons. Te- first, technical reasons. Both countries have s- problem with s p e n d nuclear fuel. The United States is pay- paying more than a billion dollars so far on the lawsuits coming from the utilities. We don't have a place to send waste, even not interim, central interim storage facility in the United States. The United States has made a strategic decision not to use Purex anymore. So what is going to happen to those spent nuclear fuel? Well, there are providers of those reprocessing technology, Russia and France, and if the countries who want to do reprocessing, they may go with Russia or China, I mean France, and they may continue to develop a pure plutonium stockpile out there, which is not a good thing. South Korea has a very small land, As many of you know, we have a very uh, problematic situation in spent fuel management. Uh, 
South Korea needs time and also technology to reduce the burden of spent nuclear fuel, waste disposal. As many of you know, maybe this pyroprocessing has some benefit uh, in terms of reducing the burden on spent nuclear fuel. It has the capability to reduce the heat load so that the footprint size for the disposal facility repository could be reduced as, almost, as large as by a factor of 100, which is significant for this small country. You know, there are a number of economic reasons for, for this cooperation, including some of these technologies. Right now, U.S. is building a new nuclear power plant in Georgia, a plant, and they're building a nuclear power plant in China. And the design work, or maybe even pressure vessel or steam generators are provided by Koreans. So there are very active cooperation going on between the United States and South Korea. Uh, UAE, the nuclear construction project by ROK, Westinghouse has 5% share in that. So out of that 20 billion project, Westinghouse is getting 1 billion. I have done simple calculation based on some mathematical modeling. If US ROK collaborate and be successful in terms of taking over some of the market, future markets, US could have economic, direct economic benefit of a few hundred million dollars up to one billion dollars per year based on this cooperation with maybe increased nuclear export. Uh, U.S. ROK has very strong nuclear power industry, but if you compare their weaknesses and strengths, they are very complementary. If U.S. ROK works closely in their nuclear industry development, it could work for the benefit of both countries, including nuclear export. Uh, what if U.S. or ROK do not have any of the reprocessing capability at this point? What will happen? Right now, the United States doesn't have any reprocessing technology. ROK neither. The, a country's decision to import technology, a vendor, uh, depends a lot of things like safety, economics, uh, demonstrated performance in terms of meeting the, the schedule. Along with those things, potentially there is maybe benefit of assuring fuel supply and then potentially spent fuel treatment services. Only two countries can provide it right now, Russia and France, and potentially China. United States and South Korea or Japan cannot provide it service at this point. Maybe not Japan. That means in the future, the market is going toward those countries who can provide the full services. Russia is working very hard at this point to really expand their share in the nuclear market. All of the previous military uh, complex are now put together under Rosa Rosatom, and they're making just very serious effort in exp expanding their nuclear power exp export. Um, we've seen that from Turkey, Vietnam, and some of the African countries. So if we continue this trend, we, it's not surprising to see that Russia is going to dominate. Maybe that is followed by China. So what is that in terms of political or global as, uh, development in the future? I think one of the main interests in U.S. foreign policy is being able to predict what is going to happen in the next several years. I think U.S. foreign policy cares a lot about the potential uncertainties rising. If this nuclear development continues as, as it is today without potentially this close collaboration between U.S. or ROK, the future of nuclear power industry is going to be dominated by non-Western countries. That has huge implications in terms of safety, safeguards, security, non-proliferation. The current regime or governance system set up by U.S. mainly. Right now we have 430 reactors out there. 300 of them are based on U.S. technology. But that is not going to be continued. So this development has potentially large impact on the future global nuclear industry development, future global nuclear governance issues. Let me just summarize that uh, I believe Korea's fuel cycle technology development is not going to lead nuclear proliferation. 
It is not setting up a bad example, perhaps a good example. Uh, this cooperation can be set up such a way that it can be win-win for both countries for technical reasons, economic reasons, political reasons. It could be developed to strengthen the global nuclear governance for a safer world, and this could promote the, the true Adam for Peace vision. I will stop. Okay, thank you, and thank you for all the panelists for your in-depth presentation. Um, with moderator's prerogative, I will raise first question to all of you. Because of the limited timeline, we just uh, we, we don't have many options for the negotiation. And some of you briefly mentioned about it, but I'd like to get answers from you, all of you, at the same time. The first option, I think, is uh, the, to renew the agreement as it is. The second one is to expire the agreement and the Korea should seek the, the other partner. And the third option would be the extended for five or <laughs> ten years. Or we should put all our efforts to make the negotiation work. So at this time stage, what do you think is the most feasible option among those, not the best option, which, which will be the feasible option? Mark, short answer will be appreciated. Well, as I said, I, I think the most feasible option at the present time is for a extension of the current agreement to permit uh, for a short period of time um, further reflection about the future of the cooperation away from the political area. We, arena. We've just had a, a nuclear test in North Korea and we've seen at this meeting just the last two days how almost obsessed we've been in our discussions about the entire nuclear order in the world based on what happened in North Korea a few days ago. And I think we want to, in a sense, as we just heard, to try to um, inoculate the negotiation of the agreement away from that problem and to think about the ways in which the two countries can cooperate uh, without a lot of political noise entering the negotiation based on what happened in North Korea. Um, I don't think there's enough time to resolve the apparent major differences in the positions that have been taken by the negotiation teams between both the ROK and the United States. Basically, as my understanding is, is that we really have until June to make an agreement in time to permit uh, congressional parliamentary approval of, of this by the time the agreement, present agreement expires in March of 2014. So we don't have a lot of time, and I don't think there's a lot of time to rush through negotiation. And if I may per be permitted, what happened in Korea, in North Korea with the United States in 1994 is an example of what can happen when a negotiation is under duress. We made a negotiation resulting in an agreed framework, which was an agreement which was flawed. Um, it had a an extremely in, imperfect verification regime, which, because the verification regime for that agreement was held hostage to the bilateral relationship between the United States and the DPRK, when that fell apart, the agreement failed. We do, that was under duress. We do not want to have a negotiation of a cooperation agreement between the ROK and the United States hostage to political developments from the, from the DPRK. We want to, as we just heard, keep the focus of the negotiation on the basis of the cooperation and, and keep it away from uh, a discussion of how the North Korean uh, issue could poison the negotiation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I also have a quite the um, uh, same uh, opinion with uh, what the Mr. Hibbs just said. I mean, practically speaking, it would be, I, I guess, quite difficult for the two governments to come up with a completely new government by the first half of this year. And I think uh, what uh, Scott has said, I mean, the truth, uh, the, we, we, as we always say, is that uh, the devil is in the details. <laughs> and uh, it needs to be worked out at the technical level 
And so it may actually take more time than we, we thought, but the only problem is that we have this, as, you know, the, the, the setup, uh, I mean, the, in the, our mindset, there's, there's a certain deadline that maybe if we cannot reach that deadline, maybe something is completely off. I mean, that should not be the case. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, practically speaking and uh, technically speaking, there can be always some extension of this negotiation, and uh, we need to uh, realize that kind of uh, possibility, and again, not to politicize uh, that issue. And we do have a plenty of a previous you know, case where in which we have this you know, extended negotiation in the meantime, Maybe uh, the, the existing uh, within the existing framework, and uh, still with the possibility of coming up with a certain new uh, form of uh, you know agreement. And um, I mean, I don't know whether this could be a good example, but uh, the thing I, I, that come up to me is that uh, this ROK U.S. Uh, negotiation or agreement about uh, the wartime operational control uh, transfer, which was supposed to be few, uh, three years ago, then due to certain uh, situation in the Korean Peninsula, the South Korean government uh, asked for the extension of that uh, WOC transfer to uh, 12, uh, 2015. So, I mean, if only these two governments can acknowledge, there could be some technical issue, and for that matter, for temporarily, we can extend this negotiation. In the meantime, they need to come up with some more constructive uh, uh, you know, negotiation and agreement that uh, can be quite uh, doable, I think. Well, I agree that the most feasible approach right now would be to extend the current agreement in order to buy some time. Uh, but I think that the real opportunity lies with uh, completing the joint PIRO study as a basis upon which to examine uh, the issue of advanced consent. Uh, Mark mentioned that in his initial remarks, and I think that that makes a lot of sense uh, as a point of entry for uh, really addressing that set of issues. Aaron? Extension might be an option. but. You need to understand one thing. It, this cannot be done just simply by the executives, okay? You have to get the cooperation of Congress and what that would require. In other words, you can't simply just say, oh, yeah, both parties agreed to extend. This agreement um, is one of two that was not renegotiated after the Nuclear Nonproliferation Act. It was uh, Korea's and Taiwan. Uh, it does not have rolling extensions. Many agreements have rolling extensions. And actually, the Japanese agreement can go on in perpetuity if the parties... So we don't actually really have to renegotiate the Japanese agreement um, if we don't want to. But uh, what it would require is Congress would have to pass a bill that said, notwithstanding Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act, we are going to extend this agreement for whatever amount of time, five, ten years. My guess is Congress wouldn't want to extend it, definitely not more than ten years, but maybe not more than five. And you've got to get that passed. And it's hard to pass a law. <laughs> it's hard to pass a bill in the Congress. So maybe you attach it to a appropriations bill. You need a champion in Congress to do that, in the U.S. Congress. It's not clear who that might be. However, for all the reasons that Mark mentioned, you know, the political issues with DPRK and security issues, they might be amenable to that. You could say, look, this is a very sensitive time. We're working on this joint spent fuel management. It's not just a joint pyro study. We're looking at all the ranges of spent fuel management options. And, um, and uh, so, so that might be a possibility. But in order for that to happen, Somebody's got to get to work on this very quickly. <laughs> Professor Yim? I have, I've already stated sort of my position on this, but I think extending may be a, a good thing, but I am concerned also about the ramifications. South Korea's maybe inability to make, come up with a position or policy on spent fuel management. That is a huge issue at this point. So there has to be a clear guideline if we do extend 
what can South Korea do in terms of this and full management? Could I respond to that? Just uh, There are things you should be doing already, which is on interim storage uh, and your repository. So the issue of the saturation of spent fuel pools is, <laughs> is not something that's going to be solved by pyroprocessing. And so even though it would be useful to have you know, a plan, you know, moving forward on pyroprocessing, you have to do those things anyway, so... Yeah, I, I agree, but then there is a roadmap that people have been working on that includes what happens with the internal storage, when does it end, when do we start disposing it, when do we start maybe treating it, or can we even have a fast reactor? All of them are related to this discussion. But, but interim storage could last in dry cast storage for 100 years. Mm, well, That's theoretically, <laughs> yes, theoretically, yes, but then right now we don't have a central storage facility. The public, the, the community people are against having a stored spent fuel beyond the lifetime of nuclear power plant. Once the license expires, the public doesn't want to see any of the spent fuel in their site, period. Okay, uh, I, I, I believe there will be lots of questions from the floor. And before your question, please identify yourself, indicate the panel your question are directing to, and please be brief. Okay, Duyan will be the first one. Duyan? Yeah. Hi, Duyan Kim. My question is for uh, Mark. And I'd also like to get the thoughts of Professor Shin Sang-ho and Scott for your regional expertise. Picking up from Mark's uh, parting comments, uh, sure, the U.S.-India deal was a train wreck. It was, it was a big mistake. Being a non-proliferation myself, yes, I was right there with everyone criticizing that. But it was also clear that that was a political decision in the sense where um, it fits with the U.S. Uh, broader geopolitical strategic interests and objectives. Um, looking ahead, could you foresee a scenario or a picture in which um, a similar consideration might be applied uh, to South Korea? Or is that in, in which the U.S. may want to consider being more flexible on ENR or programmatic consent um, to fit with America's broader geopolitical and strategic interests? Or is that picture more um, heavily rooted in the nuclear uh, industry and market um, picture that you've painted, Mark, and I'd like to get um, Professor Shin and Scott's um, okay, We will thoughts. have two more questions and move back to the panelists. Okay. There. The risk, Ariel Levite from the Carnegie Endowment. At the risk of saying that political science is too complicated a problem. I think it's uh, short-sighted to uh, refer to this as an energy issue or for that matter as a technical issue. It's just power processing. Let's define it one way or the other. I think there are two very heavy political considerations here. First, let's remind ourselves that the 99 agreement, 1991 agreement between involving the, uh, the ROK and the DPRK is one work which calls for the ROK not to do either reprocessing or enrichment. So if uh, the ROK does go ahead, it automatically breaks that agreement. Now, you can say that the, the DPRK has already broken its commitment. That's fine, but there is no way of disengaging this. Similarly, there is no way of extricating this from global U.S. non-proliferation policy. And I think specifically the issue at hand is now Iran. If Iran goes ahead and is allowed under some agreement to enrich, clearly saying to South Korea that it can't, simply will not fly, and the other way around. I think we are wary of ad hoc arrangements, call them Rakashimura, call them Brazil, call them India. The risks are enormous. We have to see all of this in context. The context could be criteria-based. Democracy, nuclear energy program, transparency, and so on. But let's not kid ourselves about the global implications and the regional implications, particularly in this region. And the last question will be from the Professor Kang at the back. I have two short comments, you know. Uh, there will be a world market for nuclear power and uranium enrichment, even after the Fukushima. But however, I don't think there will be a world market for reprocessing for the foreseeable future. And second thing is that uh, 
I think we South Korea need any kind of R&D activities for safe management of spent fuel. We have, but we have a diverse voice in alternative for spent fuel management. No. So we need a serious debate domestically whether which one is good or bad. Thank you. Then back to the panelists. Mark, do you have uh, anything to say? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the U.S. Indian deal providing a template for a, a deal with, with, between the U.S. and the ROK. Um, but in the broader sense, points you're raising bring to mind that there would have to be some flexibility provided in the discussion between the U.S. and Korea. And I think if we have an extension or of an agreement or a rollover of the agreement that provides us to <coughs> discuss this in a little more detail, we may be able to move in that direction. Um, one of the questions that, that I have heard from people asking me this, in, in both in governments and outsiders, is whether the the dilemma for the, the energy problem uh, in Korea is put forth um, on the panel would motivate the ROK government to be very firm uh, with the United States and, 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 and really refuse to cooperate or co refuse to, to uh, to compromise on, on the demands it has. And as I think Scott said before, it, it's pretty unlikely that it would go to the brink. And I think this is an opportunity that we would have. We extend the agreement, we could deal with it to sort of prevent the negotiation from de-escalating. De de-escalation is in part a bureaucratic problem. Um, in the ROK, the demands that have been put into the ROK position rep represent the interests of a number of players in the Korean nuclear community. Just to give you an example, it's the Korean Atomic Research Institute that is highly keen to go forward with a processing program. Um, on the other hand, filling into the ROK position is the position of, of KEPCO, which is has a keen interest in, in uranium enrichment. Um, KEPCO, to my knowledge, is, is not uh, intrinsically interested in power processing, but there are these different interests in the community, and all of those interests are folded into the negotiation position, making it a very maximalist position, which is very difficult because of the bureaucratic process for the ROK side in the negotiation to back off of it. In the United States, we have a, another problem which inhibits the ability of the U.S. executive branch to behave in a flexible manner. Um, if you go back to the Indian Agreement, you will recall that the Indian Agreement happened because President Bush wanted it to happen. If it was up to the executive branch at that time, there would have been no Indian Agreement. They would have never have proposed or moved forward on, an, on, on a proposal like that. It would never have and so here we are in a situation in a bilateral negotiation between the U.S. and the ROK, and it's up to the executive branch bureaucracy to really deal with this. Um, and, and because, again, it is not really taking uh, a proactive position and, and looking at this as, as an opportunity to make a, 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 a breakthrough in our relationship with the ROK, we have there also on the U.S. side bureaucratic um, inhibitors that are preventing um, a clear result from from resulting from coming out of this negotiation. So, you know, I, I just don't. It's it's not driven from the top, and 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 likewise in our position on the 123 policy outside of the ROK negotiation, there's an absence of direction from the top leadership in the U.S. government to, 
to craft a policy. This has been, this has been left to an interagency discussion at the working level. And it's difficult to, to think in a highly constructive, creative way to move this negotiation forward because of that. I think Professor Im will have some comments on the questions. Uh, going to the question raised about 1991 or two joint declaration of denuclearization of this Korean Peninsula. Uh, when I learned something about the law, the professor told me the most important thing in, in setting up a law is the intention or motivation of the person who's setting up the law, not the language itself. So when South Korea and North Korea agree that we're going to have this denuclearized peninsula, we want to be, make sure that this peninsula is free of nuclear weapons. Uh, I believe South Korea is fully committed. Uh, there is at this point some movement uh, on coming up with new legislation piece, Nuclear non Proficient Act. That's sort of going, but then I don't know whether that will be matured and will become a, a reality soon. But then there is no question that there is a firm commitment to nuclear non proliferation in the Korean Peninsula. When we talk about ENR capability here, this is basically something about the commercial nuclear power and potentially economic benefits and potentially energy security issues. So it has nothing to do with nuclear proliferation aspects. Uh, going back to the question raised by Dr. Kang, will there be a market for reprocessing? That's a, a good question. There will be some market for nuclear power. According to the 1990, I mean 2012 summer IAEA projection, there will be maybe minimum of 90, additional, 90 gigawatt electric additional market, or maybe up to 370 additional gigawatt electric in the future by 2030. So when those countries develop nuclear power, or some of the countries existing uh, users of those technologies, eventually they have to solve their spent nuclear fuel problem. Be it whether there is a repository or there is a reprocessing, some, something has to be done. Those countries do not have the capability to develop their own repository. They, those countries do not have the capability to develop reprocessing capability either. Somebody has to provide a service. As, as I said, it is likely that those spent fuel may be pro, uh, services provided by Russia or Japan, China. Is that the world we want to see? That's the question I'm asking. Sarah? Yeah, very briefly. There are some of us who believe that you can have nuclear energy without reprocessing and do very well, and it's pretty cheap, and the U.S. has 104 reactors, and we've done pretty well so far. Pretty but well, I will, but you have no place to go. At that this is point. true, <laughs> but nobody else has a repository anyway. But I Finland, would, you made Sweden. a statement <laughs> that, market, that the market is going towards countries that can provide fuel, full fuel cycle services. I agree that it would be a huge incentive for countries to provide cradle to grave. That doesn't necessarily mean reprocessing. It means a grave, yeah. a repository. <laughs> so, but when you look at the actual numbers related to reprocessing, it's fallen off, and that is because it's an expensive option. Um, just briefly on Ellie's question. You said, well, if Iran can enrich, how would we ever keep anybody else from enriching? Let's be clear. In this agreement, the U.S., it's about consent to enrich or reprocess U.S. origin fuel. The last time I checked, we didn't have a nuclear cooperation agreement with Iran. I don't think we will have a nuclear cooperation with Iran. But I take your point that from the optics of all of it, that whatever happens with Iran could be very damaging to the non-proliferation regime. We just published a report by Fred McGoldrick on nuclear trade gaps, which looks at how countries uh, handle all of these different consent rights in their nuclear cooperation agreement. What I would say is that we all need to be quite consistent. And, I, and one area in which I think the U.S. and ROK should cooperate is looking at exactly at what restrictions do we put in our nuclear cooperation agreements uh, to strengthen nonproliferation. Um, as you can see here, we are far from agreement, but we have to close this session, so the discussion will be continued over the coffee table, and thank you for your participation. Thank you.